Anyway, so I wanted to follow up a little bit on something we talked about last week, right. only because you know some news came out after we were talking about Zalora. Yeah. So Zalora is a fashion play in Southeast Asia financed by Rocket Internet. I think we talked about it a little bit. I think you're very familiar with this. And, you know, the news cycle from last week was that it's being sold or it's being wound down or it's definitely being made smaller for sure. And I think that's actually a fact. But after we talked about this, so what is it on March? February 28th, so before March started. But on March 2nd, Tech in Asia came out with a story and I just, I love this. I think this is going to be slightly thematic of the things about which we talked this week. Mm. You know, it starts off with this. The rhetoric about a financially struggling Zalora and its retreat from Southeast Asia has gotten very heated. It's not entirely true. Hmm. Um, <laughs> you know, it says it's doubling down on investment in the Philippines and a whole bunch of other things. And, you know, I, I think the key here is that it says that the CEO is saying that it is, and I quote, right, and I think I put this out there, it's fully profitable in terms of variable margin in 2016. Hmm. That's a big statement from Paulo Campos III, a guy I would call Paulo Three Sticks. But anyway, fully profitable in terms of vari variable margin. Now, first of all, I'm not really sure what that means, and to be fair, I didn't even look it up. But, but the key is that if you have to qualify your profitability, it's likely that you're not profitable. And the story, which is entitled Now Profitable in the Philippines and some other texts, in the middle of the story, it says, however, it bears mentioning that Zalora remains unprofitable overall. Right. Um, <laughs> but it expects to have a turnaround soon. And again, that's in quotes, soon. All right. So, so explain explain to me, explain to me. I don't get this bit because I read that and thought, well, what's going on here? Is there some sort of financial wizardry? I mean, you're an investment banker by trade. You know what's going on, right? <laughs> Okay, let's be careful. Um, I worked at an investment bank, mostly doing trading, but I but I get the I understand the sentiment. Um, this is just what this is just Orwellian doublespeak when it comes to profits. Right. Right. I mean, it's almost like, and I hate to I hate to say this. It's like, you know, I'm 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 fully not pregnant except for the baby I've been carrying right, for right, the right. past three months, and I, I I think it's kind of fair to say that. Um, I understand the CEO's perspective, but you cannot be profitable at, but not profitable and expecting a turnaround soon. And I don't think there's any lack of nobility in the fact that you're you know, building a company. I mean, Amazon said for years we can be profitable whenever we want, but we're not profitable now because we're building. And I think you've got to give at least Jeff Bezos or Bezos the credit for saying – will be profitable when it makes sense for us to be profitable. We're in a building stage. And over the 22 or so years of that company's existence, they've had some quarters where they've made money. And I presume they could have had plenty of other quarters where they might have. But the only way to get from being the biggest bookstore in the world and to selling CDs online to being literally the biggest online retailer and largest logistics player, you know, creating fresh content for television and movies and actually, what did they, did they win an Academy Award? I think they, they did last week. The point is to do that, you've got to invest and there's no, no, there's no problem in saying we're investing. Mm. But to come out and say we're profitable in terms of this, that, or the other thing, but not really profitable to me is disingenuous. I think it just gets to one of the things that, you know, I want to point out about the region and that is, let's, you know, let's just grow the ecosystem. Let's grow it up. Let's get, let's get bigger about the way we talk about, um, the things that are that are going on here. Um, and I just wanted to point it out because we had spoken about it. I don't want to spend a ton of time talking about it this week unless you have more questions about it. But I just wanted to point out that the rhetoric around this company and other rocket internet companies remains the same, really. And regardless of what the CEO of the company says, this company is not profitable. And to be fair, I don't think it has an avenue towards profitability. So I think it's a little bit of a head fake. Hmm. I mean, I was looking at the financial highlights here. They're not bad, are they? On the top headline figures, 300% revenue no. growth, 900% customer growth. I mean, there's some bad money management going on there, right? I mean, if they're not profitable right. with that, the 900% increase in customers. Wow. <laughs> right. I, but again, it gets back to, you know, you can, you can 
be proud of Amazon for some things, but I'm proud of it for other things. How many Kindles have they sold? Right, yeah. You don't know because there's, again, there's this concept that, you know, we've sold more of that than we've sold of anything else, but we don't know how much you've sold of those other things either. So I, I just... You know, again, I was having a conversation with someone completely off topic on this today, but why can't people just come out and just really say what they're really thinking? But does it take it. a certain type of leader? I mean, if you look at, there's a whole bunch of, you know, IT companies, I suppose, like Amazon or Apple, who for years didn't return any profits to the shareholders and they just reinvested all their earnings back into the company, right? So all that cash, you know, we're going to give it to the shareholders or we're going to stick it in the company. But that took a certain type of leader, didn't it? Somebody who could actually stand up there and say, right, you know, this is how it is. And we're not going to give you anything for the next 10 years because we're going to stick it back in the company and grow. Right. But look at, so we talk about what they gave back to their shareholders, but look at Amazon's stock price. Right. I mean, at some, at one point it was trading over a hundred times and it probably still is 120 times future earnings. Apple obviously was trading a lot less, 13 or 14 times um, projected earnings but you had a stock that was going up 30, 40, 50% a year. So whether you were getting a dividend in the form of a quarterly or semi-annual payment, or that dividend was baked into your capital gains, I don't think most investors really cared. Yeah, yeah. Right, but again, if you look at, we talked about this weeks ago when it came to Lazada, but if you're investing at a $3 billion valuation, which actually has a physical stock price associated with it, and you're then selling at a billion dollars, there's no dividend, there's no profit, and there's no capital gain. Hmm. And Zalora seems to me to be falling into the same category. And you're right, as a, as an investment banker or as a trader, you, you don't like this story. This is a stock, I, we've not talked about this, I don't think, but I have this idea, and I hadn't d decided to speak about this tonight, but I had this idea, right? In a listed stock market, if I don't like the value of a company, I can always borrow that stock and sell it short, hmm. right? And I had talked for months, maybe for years, about s creating a way for me to sell Lazada short. Right. Was that a personal the... grudge that you had against these guys? No, it wasn't. It was just that I just didn't think – Right. again, you can watch what happens in the private markets and the non-listed markets the same way you watch what happens in the listed markets and just say – you know, there's a greater fool theory, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, some if somebody who doesn't understand the investment criteria invests in Toyota and you think it's too expensive, you can just sell them as much as you want. And if you're wrong, the market rallies through you. You have a margin call. You've got to cover your short position. The stock goes up by definition and you lose money. But if you're right, the borrowed stock that you've sold back to the market at a specific price goes down 20, 30, 40, 50%. You make money. You're allowed to make that investment decision. And I think there should be a way to do it in the, um, in the, in the non-listed markets as well. I just haven't come up with a good way to do it yet. So there's no vendetta there. It's just I'm a value guy from right. beginning to end. You'll find a way. I'm sure the rocket internet guys are going to love you. Oh, I'm sure they don't like me already. All right. But, but yeah, now, now that you can short their stock... Or short any of their listed companies, well, unlisted companies, they're going to love you even more, right? <laughs> they will. Michael, wait, short I... on Rocket Internet, anything that they seem to do. Well, recently, right? I mean, show me, sure, they've got a big, and I, we talked about this a little bit. I cannot never remember the name of the big, great, successful fashion retailing company they have in Europe, but it does kind of dominate the market there. But in, in their emerging markets where they made their biggest plays or their biggest splash, they're not really doing that much. Yeah. Um, and good luck to, I think it was the Qatari government who created a very large fund with those guys to invest all over the world, or I, I don't know, but I don't think that's going to work either. Yeah. Um, anyway, and, and I think he was really, the, the CEO said one other thing that just shows he doesn't know what he's talking about, and that is, um, you know, that the Rocket guys haven't sold any of their existing shares. Yeah. They sold... They sold new shares. So new shares means dilution. So existing shareholders just got diluted. So even if they sold at the same price level, they own less, which means the value of their shares is now lower. So hmm. maybe somebody does need to take a course on actual stock valuations. But anyway, so I, I, th I thought that was interesting as fall. But I also wanted to follow up as well on, um, you know, new funds. Hmm. You're seeing a just really quickly, you're seeing a whole bunch of new funds pop up, and it was, you know, both positive and negative feedback for this RHL fund that, that popped up. Um, 
you know, in that the headline I didn't really like, rich Asian millennials pool their family fortunes to build a venture fund. This is on Bloomberg. Um, but, you know, these are kids, I think, that really have the right idea. Hmm. They have convinced, and I, I like this, actually, they've actually done a good job of convincing their families that the businesses in which their families operate today may not always be the cash cow that they are, and that the only way to join the new economy is by taking some of the cash flow that they have now and diving in head first. And if they can do that, which is kind of similar to what the Lippo Group did with its Ventura Fund, a fund that I have great respect for, um, Stefan Young, T. Bongchai, two great investors. I mean, also great for the ecosystem as well. And I'm hoping that these um, RHL, this RHL team can do it. You look at Rachel Lau, who's one of the team team members there. You look at where they went to school and what they've studied and what they've tried to do. Um, these are all really well-educated and clearly hardworking kids. And I think at some point you got to give them credit for going out on a line, publicizing what they're going to do. Because just remember, if they fail, they fail in public. Hmm. And you can make all the commentary you want in some cases about they're just rich kids with wealthy parents who are trying to use their parents' you know, money and fortunes to, to make their own money. But the reality is that this is the way ecosystems get built. Right, right. It has to start somewhere, right? It does because they could do the reverse and just hoard all this capital. Right, but what they're right. saying is they want to go out and do it and they want to, have other, they want to convince other people to work with them. Yeah, so yeah. I'm happy. I think what they're doing is great, and I would I would support them wholeheartedly. And they've also convinced some really good advisors to help them as well. And it just fits into what we were talking about. So I just wanted to follow up on that as well. Well, I think that's great. More of it, and hopefully we'll see more of this rather than sort of sticking the money in the family office and just hoarding it in their own mini little hedge fund. They can, um, you know, put some of that into the ecosystem. Yeah, and again, it's like two generations of risk takers now because to do this, to convince your father, your mother, your uncles and your aunts to give you money means that you've now made the risk discussion with them a positive event. And, and that's hard to do. Yeah. So in that sense, you've got to give these kids, and I'll call them kids because they're 29 to 30 or whatever in that age group. And I, you know, I just give them a lot of credit for being able to go out and convince them that, you know, let's not invest everything we have in real estate like we've always done or in manufacturing. Let's invest in some of the new stuff. So good for them and good for the entire ecosystem. Mm. You have four family fortunes from around the region saying, Let's try. Yeah. And I, I just, that's really, really good. And they want to raise, what, 100 million? I was just looking through yeah. here. Yeah. So it's yeah. No I mean, they want, they want, they, yeah, they want to get to be as big as they possibly can. And again, because they're committing some of their own capital, the likelihood that they'll be able to convince other people to invest along with them is really good. And again, at this stage of development, it's pretty unlikely that they're going to charge, and I don't, I don't know, I, I don't remember all the details, but they're probably not going to charge their friends the management fee, but they will probably take a performance fee, right? With the idea being, we're going to pay attention to this every single day, and we're going to make sure that you have the best opportunity to make money, no guarantees, but we're going to do the best we possibly can with all of our connections and all of our experience to make sure that... Um, that we, that we create the best environment for you guys to make money. And that, that's a good thing, I think, for the whole ecosystem. It's going to be interesting to see what they invest in as well, isn't it, Michael? That they, you know, it, I know this sort of leads into our next news item as well, but it's sort of, if you can imagine their business background and their family backgrounds are real, you know, traditional businesses and the unsexy stuff, I mean, just looking here, I mean, real estate being one, but also one of the families has made their money in, rubber gloves i mean of all businesses yeah. it's not like <laughs> you know compare that to the unicorns from the uh, uh we're coming up to demo days aren't we but the unicorns from the the y combinators and stuff like that it's a complete world apart so i know you know they're not involved in making rubber gloves themselves but you know that's the traditional that's the that's the family heritage isn't it? that's their way of thinking so you know whether they're going to invest in stuff which is i suppose less bs would be really interesting yeah, I like it. And and look, they've already taken over a startup with which I'm familiar, a company called Perks. Perks was started by a guy named Andrew Roth. The idea, the original idea, and I think it's has since um, pivoted, right, to provide corporate clients with data um, and analysis on consumer behavior. But the, their previous business incarnation was they were just trying to provide, um, you know, loyalty points and perks to people that often went to the same coffee shop or the same store, right? Yeah. Um, but they've basically taken over this company, so they've invested locally, but they also invested in a company in Los Angeles. 
Mm-hmm. And they've invested along, you know, it says here, pop, pop stars like Beyonce and Adele. I'm not sure that's a great idea, but at least they're going far afield as well. Mm-hmm. And I, again, I think that's a good idea. We talked about it last week with the K2 Global team. Someone has to bridge the gap between what's going on in Asia and Southeast Asia in particular and in the rest of the world. And if this team gets connected to capital and investments in the rest of the world, then fair enough. Let them invest overseas and then they'll have reverse investment back in Southeast Asia as well. I'm a big supporter. So hopefully they don't disappoint the region, but I don't think they're set up to do that, actually. Right. So there's, these are guys to watch. So this is RHL Ventures. Yeah. And, and again, I like the fact that it's a multicultural group. And I like the fact that um, it's not just a bunch of guys. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's... Okay. So, so maybe we should... Maybe we should... Yeah, it's really refreshing to me. And maybe we can just kind of sw- switch the order of this. I want to talk a little bit about um, something that is really important to me and some people that I know that are doing, right? So we, I was going to talk about this at the end, but I want to talk about it earlier since we just mentioned a little bit of gender diversity in the fund, which I do think is a great thing. Um, you have three companies in Southeast Asia, Orami, Um, Full disclosure, I'm kind of an investor in that company through a a couple of avenues. Grab, which everybody knows, and Kaidi, which is like the largest secondhand market in Southeast Asia and part of a much larger company globally. So they've got businesses all over the world and they consolidate them in together. But Kaidi is run by a guy named Tiwa York. I'm not very familiar with the Grab team, but Orami, the chief marketing officer and one of the founders of this, is a woman not called Shannon Kalyanamit. Shannon's a good friend of mine as well. I mean, Shannon's been doing events and having course, sort of parties to raise awareness for women's issues for years. This is not a new thing for her. And Tiwa York, who runs KaiD, is really, I mean, a, to say a pillar of the startup, the startup tech ecosystem in Southeast Asia is really to underestimate the impact that he's had over the last sort of 12 to 15 years. But I want to point out that this weekend they're doing something, I believe it's March 11th, um, to just promote gender equality as part of a UN Women's Solidarity Campaign. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Grab is doing this. So there's a little bit of PR involved, for sure, particularly with all of the news that's coming out of um, the United States and Uber. But regardless of that, just, you know, I don't, in a way, I kind of don't care why you're doing something good as long as you are doing something good. And I just want to point out that this is something that's really important. And the fact that you have a fund that is inclusive um, from a gender and also from a cultural perspective is important. But the fact that these people go out, um, men and women, to go out and support women for Women's Day, regardless of whether it's tech or startup or whatever, is just really important to me to, to, to see this happen. And they're doing it in conjunction with Women's Day, which is March, March 8th. And I just wanted to point it out so that anybody that's listening to this can see that, you know, people out here are not just trying to make and raise money and build companies, but they're also trying to create an environment which is inclusive to to all people. And to me, that's important. Where are we now with gender equality in the investment community, especially the VC side? Because I guess, you know, anybody that's sort of followed the news in this sector will know about Ellen Powell and that yep. you know that that whole saga, which dragged on, which kind of left everybody looking bad at the end of the day, whether it was her or you know the the partners that she split with. So you know that that's sort of you know it, it's a very prickly issue, isn't it? So I, I wonder where we are now. I mean, what do you see from you know your experiences and your interactions? Are, are things getting better? Is it still a boys' club? I mean, how is it comparing Asia to the rest of the world? It, to be fair, I don't think it's much different. I mean, the women that go out and actually either start companies, you know, they, they are prominently featured in, in in a way that I've seen out here. So, uh, I mean, Alexa Burdick, who, who started um, <clears throat> an online company that was then sold to Sephora, was always sort of held up as a female in, um, entrepreneur in Southeast Asia. You have Shannon, who's been at this for years, I would say almost a decade, actually, in building, starting, and, and founding companies. And then T. Sirapong Chai as well. You just have a bunch of these women out here who are really well-educated, hardworking, and they're really stepping up the game. And But they're also doing another thing too, which is really important in a way that, um, you know, we do see a little bit of in the United States, but again, because I don't live there, I don't see it on a day-to-day 
day to day basis. But these women are out there supporting all other types of equality as well. So it's not really just focused on how can we help other women, it's how can we make the entire ecosystem more inclusive. And, and for that, you know, from an investment standpoint, it is mostly men still. Um, but from a, um, from a startup standpoint, you do see a lot of really prominent women in Asia, which is a good thing. I'd like to see more. And I actually had dinner last night with a woman um, named Joy who's doing something in the startup space. She, she does it from an educational standpoint. So she's out there trying to sort of disintermediate um, governments and, and education ministries and help schools. So she provides services to schools on a for-profit basis. She's running what she calls a social enterprise. But I have a lot of time and I make a lot of time for her. And also my friend Alyssa, who's actually going to go work with her, who after graduating from Brown in the United States has come back to Thailand and is, is helping found these education-related um, companies. Both of them used to work for a place called Teach for Thailand. So very focused on education and education for children. But from an investment standpoint, yeah, you're seeing most of the companies here except for Ventura, again, where T is a partner. Most of it is very male dominated. So we still need to have that change over time. And it's a good question, right? I think it's really important. Yeah, I wonder if people are sort of aware of the situation in Asia. I mean, they may have sort of know about China and how many female entrepreneurs there are now. I mean, I'm just looking at the figures here that the the wealth of self-made female billionaires in China alone is three to four times that in the U.S. of the, the same category. So, I mean, you know, female, I don't, numbers, they outrank their American counterparts. There's more female billionaire entrepreneurs in China than there are in the U.S., et cetera, et cetera, all that kind of stuff. Whether that's a, a Chinese thing or an Asian thing in particular, it'd be interesting to know. I mean, what do you think? Because, you know, China, obviously... You know, it's it, there's all that thing about the you know parents have made the money, the daughters pick you know single child families, the daughter takes over the inheritance and all that kind of stuff. But these are sort of self-made billionaires, right? And whether it's sort of a rising tide raises all boats, or whether there's something special about Asia and being a female entrepreneur as well, which maybe in the old world, so to speak, you know, they have a bit more baggage to carry. Yeah, I mean. I think when you're dealing with green fields and blank slates, as we as we have in Southeast Asia, and that includes Singapore probably and India as well, I think you're seeing women finding that they're allowed. It's probably the wrong word, but they're encouraged to be strong. They're encouraged to be leaders. I mean, I'm just thinking about other women that I know that have built and started companies, and they've been at it for a while. Like this woman that I know who lives in Singapore. Um, who runs a company called TheAsianParent.com, Roshni Matani. She is amazing. And, and she's amazing. She runs a company really called Tickled Media. And no one's given her anything. She has just kicked, I'm going to say, she's just kicked ass for years to build this methodically, mm. taking a little bit of venture capital money, probably in the middle of the, the growth of her company. And she's blown this company out to basically the entire region and to India as well. So like the more you dig into it, I think the more you can see that at least in Southeast Asia, and you've already mentioned China, the ability and the likelihood that a woman is going to start a company, I think is higher than it might be in other places, not necessarily as high as if you're a male. But I don't get the sense when I go to startup meetings, when I go to Echelon, when I go to the Tech in Asia meetups, when I go to these things that anybody has I don't get the sense that there's some sort of gender problem going on. But again, mm. I'm a guy, right? So I might not feel it in the same way that a woman would. And um, who was it? Um, the the lady from the Harry Potter stuff, Emma Watson. What's her last name? Emma Watson was, you know, was quoted today. It's like when I was 14 years old, I was already being objectified as a sex symbol. Like this just happens. It's it's not yeah, the yeah. right way to be for society as a whole. So for me, you know, what I, I try to watch and I try to support, you know, women in all walks of life. And I've, this is not a new thing for me. I mean, I've been very focused on this since I was at Morgan Stanley, um, mentoring females and also at, at Goldman Sachs, just trying to make sure that the opportunities that were available to them 
were equal to the opportunities that were available to to men in the same positions. And I'm a deep supporter of, you know, I, there are two women that I know here. So Nikki was one of the starters of Easy Taxi. Nikki's an amazing entrepreneur as well. Um, and then also the founder of um, Eat and Lunch is also a woman named Nikki. And she's she built one of the biggest online da- online and offline dating companies in Southeast Asia. But again, I take as much time as I possibly can to go out and help them because I want to make sure that the ecosystem itself is in a position to support them and they're not fighting against um, headwinds at all times. So yeah. it's, a, it's just an issue that's really important to me. And that's why I wanted to point out the fact that this event is taking place to highlight the fact that you know, men and women, companies of, of different stripes are all getting together to support um, gender equality as part of a larger global campaign. I just think it's really important. Yeah, and it benefits us as well, us guys. I mean, let's look at it from the guy perspective. We, we benefit from this in the long run because there's that whole thing about, you know, diversity makes for a better world for everybody. I mean, they've done all those sort of social studies where they've looked at, you know, that wisdom of the crowds effect you know, where people can make decisions collectively and the more diverse the group of people, the better the decisions. I mean, you've only got to look at those boys clubs, you know, that run our bureaucracies and organizations that make decisions. You get that kind of skewed wisdom, right? But if you can throw women into that mix, then it sort of shakes the whole thing up and, you know, the BS goes out the window. I think we all benefit from it. I, I could not agree with you more. I think the more diverse you have as a group, the more diversity you have as a group, the more likely you are to come up with sort of better conclusions and better results. And I, I don't think that's heavily debated. I mean, I just cannot dis, cannot disagree with that. And I could not agree with you more. Great. We get it. We're turning it around. We're going positive. So we had a, yeah, we had a, we had a, a, a short story, but we're getting positive. So two positives. Now, what have we got next? So <laughs> Are we going positive? Um, yeah, so uh, I, I've been talking about this for a long time, right? Just, you know, as, as the ecosystem of, in Southeast Asia starts to grow and starts to mature or hopefully starts to mature, right, as we kind of weed out um, people having sort of fake stories and, and, and all this noise in, in the news, I also want to see something that's starting to happen in the United States. So this guy named Ross Baird, Baird right, who mm-hmm. runs a company called Village Capital in the United States, was quoted in TechCrunch as saying – that they're ditching their demo days. They've done 75 of these, I, yeah. I believe, over the past 10 or 12 years. This is something else that's really close to my heart. I don't think you can make a proper impression on somebody in a three-minute presentation um, where potentially your tech has gone down, you haven't had a chance to check anything, you're presenting with 15 other people, and then there are five judges on a panel who try to decide and ask you questions as to whether you're valid or not for, um, or you're qualified or not to either continue in the process or win venture capital money. I just think it's a silly thing. And I've been to many demo days. I've judged demo days. And I, I just think the whole concept of a demo day is wrong. And I like to see the fact that this is starting to happen, that people are starting to say, you know what, demo days, I'm ditching it because I don't think it makes much sense. And I like it because now I can continue to go out and fight for the fact that I think a demo day is the worst possible way to get investment. And the thing I like the best in here in this particular article, and I will try to continue to talk about this, is the best way, like nobody wins Nobody wins venture capital money by making a pitch. The only way people get invested is by having great relationships. And I think that like it's kind of, I think you saw what I put in the notes, like finally someone's figured this yeah. out, right? The point is that in no other part of your life do you make decisions from a three minute presentation, you wouldn't choose a wife that way. You wouldn't choose your bit, your baseball team or your football team that way. Just, that's just not the way things work. So the fact that somebody thought it was appropriate for, um, the money game or an investment game just always seemed to me to be slightly anathema. So I'm just glad to see people start to talk about it. And I don't really care whether it starts in Southeast Asia or it starts in the United States. I'm just glad people are talking about it. So I just wanted to point that out as well. And for people that are listening, I want them to know that like, these demo days and pitch competitions and things is just the wrong way to go about figuring out who's good and who's bad for um, investments. I just, I just think it's wrong. I'm glad that you have brought this story into today's episode because it's. Uh, I, I was really interested to see this one, Michael, and I'm glad that you, you know, you, you, you got a position on this. You're swimming upstream, but I think. Yeah. It's, I mean, uh, do you know what's that book, Launchpad? The uh, Inside Y Combinator. 
which was you know the the sort of embedded journalism so to speak of Y Combinator you know spend a, a year with Y Combinator and the partners Paul Graham and all that and sort of you know see these uh, startups go through the process and do the demo you know really being the demo day being the culmination of the whole book right so you know that really that I guess that book is one of those seminal books which has really defined every single you know wannabe accelerator that came after it right you know we're going to copy nice. this model it right. seems to be like you know demo days everywhere so, everywhere you know now that you're saying if you're if you're saying that demo days are not the best way to you know marry a startup with funding and it is marriage isn't it as you said you don't choose your wife in three seconds three minutes or whatever right no so if it's a relationship you know you've got to spend a bit of time right I'm, you know, it's interesting think, they're taking a position on this. I wonder what people are going to say. Yeah, I mean, I've been sort of quietly saying this for for a few years now. And even when I sat on a panel, I really thought this is just the wrong way to do it. You know, there was always this weird mentality of, so one of the guys who, who won actually the competition, he decided that he was going to do his pitch from an iPad. Right. And it, back when he was doing this, this was about three years ago now, right? And the event really was not set up for it, but his entire business was creating a, a POS, right? So a point of sale system for restaurants and also an ordering system that was helping automate restaurants in Taiwan and was trying to go regional. And before his, his face was introduced, the MC actually said, look, we've told these guys that they shouldn't do this because if the tech doesn't work, it's going to negatively in, impact the impression that people have of their ability to run a tech business. Right. And I just thought it's just a silly it's it's a silly way to to run a demonstration, right? In other words, if you can't set it up in three minutes and then convince me in three minutes, there's something wrong with your entire business model. Maybe you're just not great at making a presentation. I mean, I know plenty of companies that are really, really successful, but really bad at making a presentation. So I think over time you're gonna see this this model kind of fade away. And I think it's going to fade away naturally because – and I used to say this too. People, I would come back from some of these big, these big demo days and people would say, did you see anything good at the demo day? And I would say, no, because by definition, a great startup doesn't need to be there presenting mm. because their relationships, first of all, are stronger than any relationship they're going to build in a three-minute presentation or a five-minute presentation. And second of all, if their business is that good – they've probably been working on it for a while and most investors probably already know about them. And right. even if they don't know, this is the worst forum for them to get well known. The deals are probably done already, right? Before they get to demo day, they've probably secured their relationships and or built them out at least, right? I would have thought before the demo. Yes, and, and uh, sure. And another interesting um, facet of this was that you would see some of the really successful startups that maybe had just been funded or were close to getting funded walking around the floors of these um demo days and they would say yeah we decided not to go on stage because yeah. we'd rather do privately and quietly so your best actors were not on stage yeah yeah do, and it was you, never something that surprised me do you think uh you know we're sort of in a culture now we expect a shark tank like you know set up is that you know these sort of programs like shark tank or dragon's den in the uk where people walk, walk into the den and they pitch the investors and get ripped apart. Do you think that's kind of what people expect now? Is that sort of what we've been weaned on? That now people expect that that is the investment process, right? Three minute pitch, boom, decision. Yes, no, I'm in, I'm out. That's kind of what people expect now, isn't it? That's probably, as that's got a lot to answer for, right? Surely, you know, with this sort of whole attitude now. It does, but I think... And again, maybe it's just the optimist or the empathetic person in me. I've always had this concept of you don't have to be mean to be smart, mm. right? And sure, you can have a reality show like Shark Tank where people are like brutal. Like you can be honest without being brutally honest, can't you? Yeah. In other words, when someone's done presenting an idea to you, if it's only taken five minutes of your time, the necessity for you to be brutally mean to them, I think, is really is really bad. And I, I don't think it isn't a necessity at all, actually. And if they've given you five minutes of their time, it means they've probably worked for hours and for days on that presentation. And I think you kind of owe it to them to be at least polite and say, 
I don't think this idea is going to work, you know, next. There's nothing wrong with that. Ripping someone to shreds may make good entertainment in the short run, but as a way to sort of decide whether something is investable or not, I think it's really bad. Right. And in the long in the long run, I guess, you know, karma is a bitch, right? And yep. if you're going to if you're going to present yourself in that way, I think in the end it's going to come back and bite you later. So I have no time. I have no time for this. And you're right. You know, Shark Tank starts in the United States and then it kind of makes its way around the world. But by the time it's done making its way around the world, I don't think anybody cares anymore. Hey, what do I you really reckon of this? So. Um, you know, there was – sorry, just to cut in there. But, I, you know, go, go. With, with this story, there was a, a part in the article. I don't know if you picked up on it. There was – I think it was a warden professor. And she said – um something along the lines of the best investment that you can make is uh, a good looking male as your, you know, your the lead in the company. So, I mean, she did the analysis of the demo day pitches and she found that, you know, if you had a good looking guy up on stage, you had a 36% chance more success rate of getting investment. So I wonder how much that sort of actually has a bearing on the success of the company or whether it's just sort of, you know, made for TV, so to speak, you know, you've got good looking guy, probably confident on stage, you know, attractive to look at, gets the money. So it's kind of, you know, not a great environment to make an objective decision, is it? Not really. I mean, I guess you're, you're talking about this woman, Laura Huang, right? That's the one, yeah. Yeah. yeah, she's done this work and it's called Who's the Most Attractive Investment Opportunity of All? And in the end, it's good looking men. I think it's good looking anybody, really. Um, yeah, I mean, I haven't done this. I haven't done the survey, but if you go out and look at even just presidents in the United States, I think most of them are over six feet tall, and right, right. they're mostly they're they're mostly male, and they were actually mostly unfit. And the well, it doesn't make them good looking, so it doesn't necessarily fit into this. It fit, puts them in a category of people that have been working so hard they haven't had a, they haven't had time to sort of figure out their fitness. The startup world is different, though, and. You know, take a look at your startup founders. That's why most of them do kind of end up having a bias towards good-looking men. And it's just another reason why this kind of pitching mechanism is really bad. Because is this a beauty contest per se? Yeah. Or, you know, or is it a real pitching contest? I'd like to see it more of a pitching contest. So, mm. but, in, but without, without the sort of time constraint, right? Yeah, there's a better way, as you say. I think we're getting there. Well, maybe if these guys, what's the name of the, uh, is it Village Capital? Maybe if these guys, you know, they're, they're probably ones to break ground and, you know, go out against the grain and say that we're not doing demo days. Even they've done 70 odd demo days. You know, they know what- 75. Right, yeah, they know what and, they're talking and, about, right? So yeah. Yeah, for them to come and again, out and to say be, that. To, to, be, to be fair, right? We sent one of, one of the companies that we know really well in Southeast Asia, actually went to California last year, participated in a two or three month program that 500 startups offered and then pitched on stage in, in front of what the 500 team says is, you know, 400 qualified investors. Mm. Um, and, you know, our team came home without any investment from them and frankly, without any connectivity to investors. Works. This is something I, um, and I do have a bias here, so we can say that up front. But they take one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars investment from those guys. They give twenty-five thousand dollars back for the courses and the classes that they take when they go to California. Um, this was the first team from Thailand to ever be accepted into one of their batch. I don't know, batch thirteen, batch fifteen. I can't remember. And <clears throat> you know, again, at the end of the two or three month period, they participated in a demo day, like I said, and. You know, the pitch that they were doing really had nothing to do with the business. It was really just trying to get people's attention. So in the end, it was more like a beauty contest. Again, no great relationships were created. I don't hear them talking today about any of the startup relationships that they created. And there was no follow on investment from that. So I, I don't understand it. it almost, it's almost more like better PR for the investing team and the people putting on the demo day than it is a real benefit to the, um, to the startups. That's probably very true. And that's why you see, yeah, and that's why you see people like, um, again, I always go back to Jason Calacanis because I think he does a lot of really good things. You know, he has this thing called the Launch Festival, which is supposed to, you know, focus on and, and, and highlight great startups. And he doesn't charge any of the startups anything to go there. Mm. His idea is if, you know, if you're charging them, why not invest in them? Like they, they need the money more than you do. 
give them a platform where they can highlight what's good and what's bad about themselves and let investors make a decision on their own. But charging them to be, you know, what's called startup alley in most of these either demo days or, or sort of tech events is, is a bad idea. Mm. I don't think it works. And it doesn't benefit the startups. It benefits the people putting on the, um, the demo days more than anything. I don't know. I don't like it. I have never liked it. And we'll see what happens. I, I think it's going to go away at some point. We need a section on this show, a future show, Michael, in defense of demo days. We need somebody to, you know, defend that, the corner of that ring. We need to, uh, I mean, I can see what's, where they might be coming from. I mean, it's easy, isn't it? I mean, if you're dealing with volume of startups going through, to do the demo sure. day, you can deal with a lot of volume. And especially if these guys have done 70 plus, they've seen a heck of a lot of startups, right? So to yeah. process that amount of startups, and the same time from the startup side, I know you said it's not the best you know, goal for them to work towards, but they have a goal. I mean, if you if you didn't have a finite cutoff point, a day, an event where they had to, you know, it was showtime really for them, then they could spend months and months and months. You know, they don't get the twelve weeks, you know, only to to get all their shit together and get this thing done. Right? They could spend a year developing this thing. So I can see why somebody, you know, why they like demo days and why they stick with the formula. But we it would be great to hear from somebody to come on the show and defend it. You know, what is the good, you know, what works in a demo day and maybe a better format. Right. And look, I give flack to E27 often. I know them well and I, you know, I think they've done a really good job of helping the ecosystem in Southeast Asia grow. They were one of the pioneers. They still remain there. They've changed there and I'm really proud of them for doing this. So they used to have what they called satellite events for Echelon, um, which did feature you know, um, a fundraising and a pitching event for startups in every country. They would win the local thing and they'd take five, five companies from each country and then they'd send them to pitch on stage in Singapore. And what they've done now is they've, they've changed the whole model. It can, the t they're doing something called the Top 100 program and it's running all year. And then those teams get to present at Echelon Asia Summit in June. So they're changing, they're trying to sort of iterate on the model of having really quick pitching things in every country. They're doing this whole thing online and we need to find out more about it. So maybe we can talk about that on another on another episode. But I like the fact that they're trying to change the model here because I don't think the model, and I, and I think they would agree with me, I don't think they were satisfied. And again, this is one of the reasons why these guys are still going and still good is that, um, I don't think they were satisfied with what was happening in the in the satellite events from a pitching perspective, nor do I believe that they think that the best companies were being represented on stage in Singapore every June. And I think what they're finding out now is that there's a better way to do that. And they're working with another company to do the top 100. And that's going to end up actually being really, really a, a much better way to do it. And they'll iterate on that as well. So good for them. Good for them. Are we ready for a surprise? Or I mean, there's something else. So much... What was the, what's the big yeah, surprise so this much... week? I, I can't so wait, much... Michael. Yeah, there's so much to talk about it. Let's talk about something that I think is going to be a surprise going forward. Right. I don't have inside information on this. Is this, this. not a? Is this not? That's a big surprise. This is just a surprise. Well, it's kind of. This is going to be a big surprise in the future, but <laughs> not right. going to be a big surprise. You're not, you're not giving it much of a chance because anything that features on that's not a surprise or whatever it's called, that section is, is never good to feature in that section. You don't want to be in that section where Michael calls your name out. I don't think this is going to end the way people expect it to. Whether right. it ends well or not, I, I just think the market will decide. But So it was a headline a few weeks ago called Southeast, and it was in um, TechCrunch, so in global news, not just in local news, but Southeast Asia company called PlayLab invests a million dollars. That's a lot of money for a startup in Southeast Asia to invest in another company, particularly in another um, mobile game company, particularly as far away as Brazil. Hmm. So the TechCrunch story is called PlayLab invests a million dollars in Brazilian gaming startup Cupcake Entertainment. Um, you know, I always have a problem with how you name your companies. I think you want to name companies that sound strong, hmm. right? So if you named your company Viking Entertainment, it would probably sound stronger than Cupcake Entertainment. But that's just me, and that's a personal bias, and it just is what it is. But again, this starts off in a way, it reminds me kind of of the news we read about Zalora earlier today and also last week. Right, here we go. Thailand-based casual game studio PlayLab, I know this team really well, a great team, right, has turned investor 
after it invested a million dollars into Cupcake Entertainment, a Brazilian, a Brazil-based game maker. Now, a million dollars is a lot of money. Hmm. It's a lot of money, and it doesn't say kind of what stage of, of investment this is. It doesn't say Series A. Um, I know that the PlayLab team, according to this article, raised a Series A round in, in 2015 and I believe a Series B round in 2016, but we can get to that later. And they've been kind of following this company, Cupcake Entertainment, for a year. But the second paragraph starts the same way kind of that Zalora paragraph started is, well, this is not exactly what you think it is. And this is why I think it's going to lead to something that people aren't expecting. And then, then it'll really fall into the category of, oh, that's a big surprise. And it says here... You know, again, written by the same guy who covers Southeast Asia, a guy named John Russell, right? This deal is a little different in that it's not an equity investment. So in the same way that Zalora didn't have, wasn't fully profitable, so it was a really kind of loosey-goosey use of the word profit, it feels to me like this is a loose use of the word investment, right? It says this is not an equity investment. Instead, they've agreed to a profit share deal. But if What's you read that? the rest of the article, I don't know. Right. That's the point. That's the point. And when I think you're being opaque or or being obfuscating, I don't think it normally ends well. Right. I just don't think so, right? Um, I, I would say some of the jokes that sort of the late night TV people in the United States were saying when they were calling out Jeff Sessions for saying, you know, I never, I didn't speak to the Russians. And if I did, I don't remember it. It's kind of the same type of thing. They've agreed to have a profit share deal, so it's not really an equity investment. And I guess my question is, what is it? Hmm. And if it's not an equity investment, what do you get for it? And if I read the rest of the article, the rest of the article men mentions nothing about that investment and goes back and only mentions things that have happened in the past and where they have met. No details. TechCrunch is better than this. Why would they do for that? Why would, why would they... I mean, obviously, PlayLabs initiated this story, right? Why would they come out with that if it doesn't have any substance? Are they under pressure to look like they're doing something? Or what What do you think? <laughs> it's a really good question. Um, again, I always wonder when a company goes really far afield to invest in another company that's essentially a competitor. Right, so a mobile game company in, makes a, and I'll put it in air quotes, an investment in another mobile game company, but doesn't take ownership of it, just has a profit share. So if you read you know, below, it says, this has only taken 18 months to make this, in, to make this investment. Um, and even though we did have many other financing, which is not an investment, options on the table, we decided to go with these guys. We know them well, and we like them a lot. Um, and it, again, it doesn't get into any of the details or anything of it. I just think this is obfuscation. And that's just, that's just my, again, it's my bias. But I think what ends up happening is when people don't come out and say what's really going on, I think what they're trying to do is have more of a PR stunt and also more of a head fake. This feels like a head fake to me. I feel like something bad is going to happen. And I feel like someone's trying to distract attention away from whatever bad is potentially going to happen into some investment news. And remember, there's been no, as far as I know, there's been no company at the same stage of development in Southeast Asia that has invested so much money. And I feel like I'm going out on a limb here, but a million dollars in, in this region is a lot of money to invest in a company, particularly in a company that's not in the region. Remember, you talk about some of the biggest investors in the world in the startup space, and they'll say the best investments they've ever made have been in companies that are 100 miles from their office. Um, and that's just a statistical fact. So to invest in a company that is literally on the other side of the globe um, in the same space as yours, to me, just seems to be really strange. And, you know, if I, I read a bunch of stories on this and in no place does it say what the valuation is and in no place does it give any more details. Casual Game Cup and Entertainment yesterday announced a $1 million deal Right, not an investment with the same company, one of the largest independent mobile game developers and publishers in Southeast Asia. They said the money is going to be used to finance user acquisition. But in the previous article, that's in something called Afker Games, so something of which I'm not familiar. Um, and, you know, again, they say that they've been growing over the last 18 months 45%. I'm just trying to look at the 
the statistics here. So I just think this is this is a head fake. So I think something else is going on here that we won't find out um, for another few months. But what I think we will find out is that this is not actually an investment. And I just wonder why, if you really like a company and you're actually going to give them a million dollars, you wouldn't take equity ownership in it. It says this is not an equity deal. And if it's not an equity deal, then it's not an investment. Mm. In other words, but it can be, but are you lending the money? So is this a bond? I, I understand that bonds also are investments, but what's your, a bond means you get a coupon, unless it's a zero coupon bond, but then you get a principal enhancement at the end. So I, I understand how all that works, but if it is an investment, don't tell me it's a little different in that it's not an equity investment. And to be fair, um, John Russell has a, has a history of kind of Having a headline like this that it's an investment, saying that it's something, and then switching in right, like right at the beginning of the um, of the article. So I think time will tell. But you know, this really was going to fall into the category of yeah, that's a big surprise later when we find out that something is up with some of these companies. Because think about it: if you're a startup and you're taking a million dollars of your startup cash flow and not investing it in your own business. Hmm. It just makes me worried. It's like, you know, again, it's like your girlfriend going out and making dinner for another guy two nights a week. Right, it's right. like you, it's like a boyfriend taking I'm another. Borrowing the money. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and borrowing the money to do it. It's just the whole thing sounds really strange to me. So again, in the in, over the past, you know, episodes where we've talked about that's a big surprise, there has already been a result that shouldn't have been a big surprise. But I think we're going to find out here that we're going to get the same thing. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, first. yeah, it's fishy. Smell a rat. I think it's a really interesting lesson in branding as well. Maybe, you know, I wonder, Michael, if, if these guys, rather than being called Cupcake Entertainment, called Viking Entertainment, maybe you would have been longer than now. You would have been praising them. <laughs> it, all, it all went wrong when they called themselves Cupcake. It's a red light that we went through at stage one. <laughs> Nothing went right for them after that. Okay, I mean, I think I've made enough commentary on the name of the company, but right. I think you're doubling down on. We're doubling <laughs> down. Probably... They, that's where they they need to go. Yeah, they start with a base, go back to the source, and deal with that, and things will get better. I think you're doubling down on that. All right, so Play Lab and Cupcake, we don't we don't uh, we, you're not not long on them. You're short on them as well. We'll put them into the short bucket today. I'm just cupcake. concerned. Yeah, I'm just concerned, and I like. That. I like the Play Lab team a lot. I mean, they've done really great yeah. stuff. They host events. That, it's a really good team of people. But I just get nervous when people go far afield from their from their core competency, particularly at this stage of the development of the company. Um, and let's see if the growth that they've had over the past few years is is sustainable. I I, I really want it to be. Um, let let's see let's see what they end up doing. Yeah. Fantastic. So it's good. Are we covered? Have you got any more news, or will we save it to next week? Um, you know, again, there's so much to talk about, but I have a feeling we could go for like another hour and I think it's probably <laughs> best to, to stop now. <laughs> All right. I've got, let me summarize, let's summarize your, your, uh, your spots this week, Michael. In, oh, okay. in, in the short bucket, we've got, uh, who do we have? We've got Play Lab and Cupcake, obviously. Demo That's Days. Demo, uh, Zalora. Zalora are in there before the episode started. They were in there last week, right? A anything that, anything from Rocket Internet goes in the short bucket. Fair enough. By default. Well, particularly in this region, right? I mean, I think, I think their their track record in in Thailand for sure and in Southeast Asia speaks for itself, right? Again, they've made money, but boy, they have not been a money making machine for their investors, have they? Yeah, exactly. And so, in the long bucket, what's Michael Long on this week? RHL Ventures. That was interesting, wasn't it? That's the uh, those Southeast Asian second generation entrepreneurs. They look like a. I just like it. They look good, don't they? They look sharp. And then you've got the Village Capital as well. So these guys, 70 plus demo days going out on a limb and saying we're not doing any more demo days. That was really interesting. So they go in the long bucket. So they get Yeah, and to up. be fair, the, the, the E27 and Echelon team had actually said before this was announced that they were changing the way that they were going about running the final stages of their pitch competition going to that top 100 as opposed to having people pitch on stage for three minutes. I think it's a better idea. And uh, I think time will tell, but I think time will agree with the fact that they've done the right thing. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, all good stuff this week. So we've got a couple of minutes left. Tell us what you're doing this week. What's on the, the cards for Michael? What are you doing? You're busy running around again. Lots of deals on the table. Share with us what you're yeah, so again, like. 
Again, so last again last night I spent a lot of time trying to help somebody who's starting a social enterprise. She's already been very successful in raising capital for other people. She's going out to do it for herself. Um, I told her last night I have all the time in the world to help any education-related businesses, particularly ones that are helping children. And I don't think that uh, there's a conflict of interest with um, having a profit motive. I think if if you can create a profit motive. And also help people do, you know, you, you do good by doing, you know, you do well by doing good. I have no problem with it. And I actually said that to her last night. Um, I've also introduced her to a bunch of other people that I think can help her. Um, somebody else who's running a social enterprise too. And I spent a lot of time last night talking about that. You know, again, I'm working with a company called UTNE to help them raise money. This is a company that's changing the way people do search for businesses and services in Southeast Asia. Um, they're close. There's a ridiculously great team with great experience. I spent a lot of time with them. So um, fingers crossed to help them and, and, and make sure that their business continues to be sustainable. And I look forward to, you know, feedback for the audience that's listening to this. Uh, I think as every week goes by, we get more and more traction. Please send feedback to at Michael Waits on Twitter. Definitely subscribe on iTunes, go to Stitcher, everywhere else that we are. We have a YouTube channel as well, Asia Tech Podcast. If you type in on Google, you'll see we're either top three, top one, or definitely in the top five of search results there. And if you have any feedback, hashtag it with Asia Tech Podcast, um, wherever you can hashtag things, and I'll, I'll take a look at it, and we'll cover it on follow-up uh, next week. Fantastic. See you next week, Michael. Thank you, Graham.